Hello, and welcome to worship from St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Claremont, North Carolina. This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, and we are so glad that you are here with us. We are in the midst of this year's stewardship campaign, and our emphasis this year explores our call to be faithful stewards of God's abundant grace. Martin Luther, echoing what Scripture reveals, rightly characterized us all as beggars who come to God empty-handed. However, the testimony of word, sacrament, and proclamation reveal that it is God who comes to us to give and fill our lives with more than we can imagine or deserve. Given God's abundance of grace, this series has been taking up two important questions— How is it that we become and understand ourselves to be stewards of God's grace? What are the priorities and practices that faithful stewards of God's grace are called and empowered to take up and enact? And so now let us begin our time of worship. We begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. God of love, your Son Jesus Christ emptied and offered himself in sacrifice to redeem what had been lost and to restore what had been broken. Forgiven, reconciled and entrusted with the gospel, help us to be faithful stewards of sharing your love and pursuing justice for the sake of our neighbor, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for this day comes from the book of Deuteronomy, the 24th chapter. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And our second lesson for this day comes from the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. 
All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell to the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who was, who is, and who is yet to come again, Jesus, the living Christ. Amen. Today's focus is is our call as faithful stewards to cherish, embrace, and responsibly take up the love we have received and know in Jesus Christ, and which we are called and empowered to share with others. There you have it. That's the entire theme for this sermon. And to begin to look at this focus for today, I want to take up and to expand on Paul's words that we heard in Ephesians. As we do so, it will help us identify the content and meaning of the love of God we have received and which we know in Jesus Christ. Then I will transition to how we are called, empowered, and able to share that love with others. So, we want to explore the content and meaning of the love of God that we have received and know in Christ. Paul, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, captures what God's love is for us and what God's love does in and for us. He wrote, God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love with which he loved us even when when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, 
so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I want to briefly unpack what the Apostle Paul stated for us concerning the love of God. First, the content of the good news of God's love for us is that God chose to become one of us. Jesus Christ vacated the heavenly transcendent status of glory, emptied himself, and took up residence here on earth in all humility as one of us. God in Christ chose to act decisively for us, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. The entire span of Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension embodies the height and depth and breadth of God's love for us. I want to spend a bit more time unpacking what this means. God chose to empty himself in order to redeem that which was lost, to reconcile that which was broken. He suffered death on the cross and resurrected in order to remove that which separated us from God, namely our sin and our unrighteousness. In Christ's great love, we come to know and to receive by grace through faith the mercy and free gift of God's forgiveness. Our created and given destiny of a relationship with God is thereby granted to us. In addition, in receiving and knowing forgiveness, new spiritual possibilities in our relationship with one another are opened. Also new opportunities, both spiritual and psychological, open for us individually as to how we might get on with the challenge of living in our own skins. Christ chose to empty himself, to suffer death on the cross, and was resurrected to conquer the nemesis of cold, dark death. He did so to give us, by grace through faith, the inextinguishable warmth and light and vitality of life in and with God and of life with one another. It is that life that we know now and will know for all eternity. Christ chose to empty himself, to suffer death on the cross, was resurrected in order to defeat evil stranglehold on our lives. He ascended to then pour out the Spirit in and by whom Christ comes to dwell with us and is an advocate for us. The Spirit of God empowers and binds us together here and now as the body of Christ. The Spirit of God brings Christ to us, who encounters us through word and sacrament. The Spirit of God is in whom we live and grow and love and serve as the people of God. <clears throat> and we are able to look out and to cry to God in awe and joy and praise and gratitude. Abba, Father. The content and meaning of God's love for us and all humanity is manifested in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and by his decisive acts done for us on our behalf. So, sin, death, and evil do not and cannot hold us captive. Forgiven, we are redeemed, reconciled. Put to death and resurrected with him, we are given new life. The Spirit promised and poured out. We know the living presence of God in and among us. All of this Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, as he does elsewhere, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, as we look at the nature of God's love for us, it is important to note that the demonstration of Jesus' great love for us was mindfully and intentionally chosen, was lovingly willed and enacted, and was enacted to seek and to accomplish for us what we could not do for ourselves. It was done for our benefit and our good. We see the nature of his love as that of being self-emptying, sacrificial, life-giving, compassionate care, for the sake of the welfare of another. In the New Testament, that love is called agape. Agape love is 
the love of God. We have received this great love in Christ and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we are those who are called to be faithful stewards of what we have been given. And the question is, how are we to be faithful stewards of that love? Now, there are many ways to practice that, such as love one another as I have loved you, of working out things in community with one another. Or do not let the sun go down on your anger, the Apostle Paul says. Well, I mean, we need to be self-regulating and self-control. We even pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, I'm not going to talk about any of those ways, but I do want to focus here on a way that, that I believe is critical in the living of these COVID days. I want to begin with the work of a great observer of human life, and in many ways a theologian. I want to look with you at Peanuts, <laughs> the work of Charles Schultz. A comic strip in his cast of characters of Peanuts provides a way for us to think about how we are called and enabled to be faithful stewards of that great love. Two of the characters in the Peanuts long history of, of being appreciated are Schroeder and Lucy. Now Schroeder is a musical prodigy. He's been playing the piano since before he could walk. Schroeder an introvert. He keeps his inner world to himself. He does have friends. He enjoys baseball, but he was never more himself or more happy than in playing a Beethoven piece. <laughs> oh my. Beethoven was his musical hero. And anytime he was playing Beethoven, he was all in in playing. On the other hand, there's Lucy. Uh, she is someone definitely with a voice, an extrovert. She has strong opinions and is willing to share them. She is one who offers sound advice for just five cents. She looks out for her brother's Linus and rerun. She is confident. She knows what she knows. She is convinced that she will make a great president or queen someday. But Lucy has a soft spot in her heart for Schroeder. In fact, she is in love with Schroeder. However, Schroeder is oblivious <laughs> and does not return in kind. In a four-frame comic strip in the first frame, Schroeder is sitting at the piano, focused on and enthralled playing Beethoven. Opposite him, Lucy leans into the piano and asks him, Schroeder, do you know what love is? <laughs> in the second frame, it shows that Schroeder has risen from his piano bitch, and he is saying this to her. Love, noun, to be fond of, a strong affection for an attachment or devotion to a person or persons. In the third frame, Schroeder is shown sitting back down at the piano, with Lucy looking on certainly disheartened and quizzical and a bit exasperated. In frame four, Lucy, in dismay, with unrequited love, says, on paper, he's great. <laughs> he's great. <laughs> well, in the gospel lesson today, we could say of the lawyer, on paper, he's great. He recited what he thought and knew to be the greatest commandment of all, but it is clear that he did not know what it truly meant to love one's neighbor. It is clear that he did not know what it meant to love in truth and in action. It is ironic that the word that the lawyer used is the word agape, which refers to the self-emptying, sacrificial, compassionate love of God. It is that same word that the lawyer uses. But then he says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? <laughs> Jesus' parable, we must understand, of the Good Samaritan is not told to direct the man as to how he may gain eternal life. Rather, it demonstrates how those who receive and know 
Jesus Christ, who, who are called to share the love of God with others. It shows, indeed, how those who know the love of God in their hearts are to share. Let's look at the parable. A Jewish traveler has been accosted, beaten, and robbed, essentially then left for dead. Two official religious representatives walk along the same pathway. They see the man in his plight, but they choose to pass by on the other side. And they do so for reasons unknown. Perhaps they pass by out of their own fear or their own need to get somewhere or to be on time for an important appointment. Or they're not wanting to get involved because, you know, someone bleeding is going to be quite a mess. Well, in reality, their neglect does harm. It doubly compounds the harm already done to the man. It delays him getting assistance. It actually threatens his life. Both the Levite and the priest are great on paper. They have the credentials. They have the understanding. They have the right observances of worship and the law. But in the very act of embodying God's great love, they fall well short. And by contrast, the Samaritan demonstrates agape love. He mindfully and intentionally chose to empty himself of his own self-concern and agenda. Folks, as a matter of fact, Samaritans and Jews in those days literally hated each other and avoided each other. Despite that, on seeing the man, he did not see a Jew. He saw a human being created in the image of God who was in need. He lovingly willed and acted for the sake of the health and welfare of the man. He did for the man what the man could not do for himself. He picked him up, put him on his own animal, took him to an inn, paid for his care so that he would be attended to and he would find a place of rest and could heal. But what is Jesus' point in telling this story? To ask the question, who is my neighbor, is to seek to determine who qualifies and deserves help. Jesus makes it quite clear that is the wrong question. Oh, in our context today, you know, might we make distinctions? Let's see. Are you red or are you blue? Are you black, yellow, red, white? Are you a Muslim, Hindu, Arab, Chinese? Are you straight? Are you LGBTQIA? It all looks great on paper. But the truth is, it fails miserably as to giving testimony to the love of God. In the lesson, we hear these words. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The question that Jesus poses for us is this. Am I a neighbor. And that is a question for us as we consider our stewardship of God's love and how we relate to other folks, how we see them, how we encounter, how we engage them. Jesus, as the very embodiment of self-emptying, sacrificial, life-giving agape, offered positive concern, respect, and care for all and compassionately acted in order to promote humanity's good and welfare. Jesus became a neighbor to us, and he asked us to do the same. We are not called to look great on paper. We are called to faithfulness. We are called to practice that. As I think of where we are in these days, the coronavirus, it is a very highly contagious virus 
Fact is it can cause both short-term and long-term health issues. Fact, it can lead to death. As we think of who we are and how we relate to others, perhaps it would be helpful if we would keep in our minds and in our hearts Jesus' question, am I a neighbor? Today you were given hand sanitizer as a reminder of staying safe. You were given a hand sanitizer to encourage you as an act of love, to hand sanitize, to protect not only yourself, but your neighbor. It is the same with mask. 1 John 4.18 says, we love because he loved us. Romans 5 verse 5 reads, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. We are empowered to love by and with the love that is in us. Am I a neighbor? John Calvin wrote, All the blessings we enjoy are divine deposits committed to our trust on this condition that they should be dispensed for the benefit of our neighbors. Is there anything greater than the deposit of God's love? In closing, as stewards of God's grace, I invite you to worshipfully ponder the love extended to us and to all humanity as Jesus became a neighbor to all. This love was not conveyed on paper, but rather in flesh and blood, compassionate acts, nails, a tomb, in resurrection, in fire and in whirlwind. As faithful stewards of God's grace, Jesus calls us to be neighbor to others. We are called to offer and to give ourselves in self-emptying, sacrificial, life-giving love that seeks the good of the other, that offers them, offers them full positive regard and respect. In 1 John Chapter 3, verse 18, it reads, Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. May it be so as stewards of God's love. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the confidence of God's mercy and grace for us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious host, fill your church with a spirit of joyous hospitality. We pray for bishops, teachers, church leaders, and all children of God as they invite others to your table of boundless grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated. Restore valleys, mountains, and pastures, and still and running waters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill. 
strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caretakers who see to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us how you clothe all in your mercy. We pay, pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and other personal care assistance in this community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and unfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God, the creator, Jesus, the Christ, the redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.